the talk I want to give is innovation anytime, any place, by anybody. And the reason I want to talk about that is it, we're in an interesting time in both Indian history and human history. And the reason is that the old models of governing systems, we talked about systems, and governing people are no longer working at every level. So if you look at the system of developing drugs, it doesn't work. If you look at the system of education, it doesn't really work. If you look at the system of innovation, it doesn't really work. Many of these systems do not work is because they were created for a different system. Okay, they were created for a different time. So, because you, uh, as a youth of India, frankly, are in a very, very interesting position. And the reason you're in an interesting position is because you have incredible power, whether you know it or not. Basically, you are part of the 50% of India, right? 50% of India is below the age of 25. So you basically are the group of people who will run India. In fact, you have the ability to run India right now because the average politician's age is around 70. The average Indian's age is around 25. So there's some system problem there, right? So the future of India is actually within this room right here. But how will you, so yeah, you can clap, clap for yourselves, okay? So the future of India is really you. And so we're gonna talk about you, okay? It's not about me, I'll share this story about this 14 year old boy. How many people are 14 here? 15, 16, 17, 18, who's 18? Okay, 19, 20, 21. Okay, so average age is let's say about 19, okay? So you are five years older than that five-year-old boy who in 1978 invented email. So I mean, you have some advantages more than that 14-year-old, okay? But the reality is that um, you're in a very interesting position because what you do over the next five years will determine the future of India. And I mean this in a very serious way. The world needs about 1.8 billion jobs. 1.8 billion jobs. So write that number down, 1.8 billion. And we need to create 1.8 billion jobs in the next 10 to 15 years, okay? So if you divide 1.8 billion roughly by 10 years, you get about 180 million jobs a year, right? Simple math, right? Well, how are we creating those jobs? And what, how, and what are the systems that exist to create those jobs? The current system of job creation assumes that there will be a few elite educational institutions, MIT, Harvard, right? IIT, IIM, some of these institutions, and they will produce a few entrepreneurs, and those few entrepreneurs will create Facebook or Google or Infosys or TCS, and they will give hundreds of thousands of jobs, right? You agree? That's the current model. Is that model gonna work? You work out the numbers. Figure out how many Infosys you'll need to create 180 million jobs a month. And you'll find out it's not gonna work. The reason these models were created was because they were created out of a system which, again, I'm gonna use system, so we're not gonna blame anyone. We're engineers, right? Everyone's an engineer here? So engineers don't blame things, right? We try to find problems. So when I talk about government or politicians, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just talking to you about the problems, right? And we're gonna solve those problems. But if you look at these large-scale systems, that many of these old systems were designed so a few people could profit, right? So maybe 50 families could profit in India. Maybe 100 families in the United States could make money. And that's okay, that was done for an old system around the industrial era. Carnegie's, Mellon's, right, a few people. So those systems were designed so People took capital, so if, you, if I did a systems visualization of this, you would find these large systems, they sent capital to a few institutions. Those institutions attracted a few so-called smart people, and those institutions then uh, would take capital in from investors, and some few companies would come out, right? So they would take $10 billion worth of venture capital funding, and maybe they invested in 100 companies, and one of them became a Google or a Facebook right? And then you had jobs created. And everyone was happy because they could say, oh, look at this guy who was a dropout out of Harvard, and look what he did. You know who I'm talking about, right? 
But that model is not going to work because you need to create how much? 180 million jobs a month. Right? So those models won't work. The only way this can work in the future is if we make everyone in this room become job creators instead of job seekers. So I know you gave some very interesting statistics, right? About people are getting placed and all that. So I think that's one measure of success, but there's also another measure. So let me take a guess. How many people here want to join Infosys? How many people want to join a big company? Anyone? How many people would consider a success being placed in a company when they graduate? How many people? Okay. How many people here want to start a company? Okay. Good. So the reason I ask that question is the measures of institutions should not be based on how many people we get to become job seekers. Okay. That's my frank critique, feedback to you. The, the success of this institution should be how many of you became job creators, right? Very different motivation now, very different system input to the leadership here. But you see, the system inputs determine the system outputs, right? Basic engineering. So if the system input to the leadership is you must create 600 entrepreneurs, Okay, it's nice that some people got placed in Infosys and some people got placed at TCS, but how many of these people started companies and how many of those companies gave jobs? You understand? So that's what we want to talk about. How do you do that? So in 1978, we have some lessons on how innovation can take place and what are the conditions. So in 1978, there was a 14-year-old boy and he was no different than most of you in this room. In fact, he, came for, he, he grew up in Rajapalam, was born in Bombay, and he was a South Indian Tamilian. You know, dark-skinned South Indian Tamilian whose family moved to the United States in 1978, I mean 1970. But, you know, he had some interesting uh, conditions. His parents were not your ordinary Indian parents. They were very adventurous. Okay, so write that down, adventurous. They were willing to go into the unknown. They were willing to make mistakes. They were fearless. You see, my parents both had extremely good jobs in Bombay. My mother was head of the math department, and my father was the general manager for Gopala Singhania. You see, people like those typically don't leave those jobs, right? You're very happy. You have your nice home. You have everything given to you. Most people are taught that that's success, right? If you have a job, you're the head of a math department, you've achieved some success. See, but my parents never considered that success. So that's a very interesting group of people. This is in 1970, when it was very hard to get jobs, and especially for non-Brahmin South Indians to go to Bombay and to succeed. Right? Remember, there, the, India still has a caste system, which we'll talk about, which I think it's very important to talk about. And that caste system still exists. And so those two non-Brahmins, Again, nothing, nothing against Brahmins, non-Brahmins, but in that environment, they were successful. So they should have been quite happy, right? But they weren't. So here were two very adventurous people who decided to go in 1970 when there was a recession in the United States, okay? When there was a, a serious recession, and they moved to one of the poorest cities in the United States called Patterson, New Jersey, because my parents wanted adventure, and they wanted to give a different educational experience to their two children, myself and my sister. So we grew up in an interesting conditions and each year my parents, whatever money they made, they would move to a better school system. In the United States there's no private schools at the time. Public schools are based on property taxes. If you move to a wealthy neighborhood you get a better education. So in seven years my parents moved to one of the wealthiest school systems in the, in the United States. They went from a poor school system in the entire country to the wealthiest. But what I experienced before coming to India was I grew up in Rajapalam and I grew up with my grandparents who were poor farmers, extremely poor farmers. I had families, some of them who lived in a hut and others of them who had nice apartments. So a wide range of differences of income. So as a child, even when I was six years old, for some reason I didn't like these disparities. You follow? I didn't like the fact that there was such differences in wealth. And I would question that as a six-year-old child. I didn't like these systems, these in, in, you know, uh, unequal systems. So when I came to the United States, I saw the same inequality in the United States. Patterson, New Jersey is predominantly African-American, dark-skinned people. 
And you saw the same segregation in the United States. So that was always in the back of my mind. And what was in the back of my mind was how could I change the world? Okay? So my heroes were people like, you know, Subhash Chandra Bose, okay? My heroes were Bhagat Singh. Those were my heroes. I didn't care for some of the other Indian leadership, frankly, but I liked those because those people fought. They actually wanted to fight for our liberation, which I thought was more interesting for me. So those were my heroes. So when I came to the United States, I was very compelled to work very hard because I wanted to do something what others had not done because I saw back in India how little people had. You follow? It was, it was highly motivating for me because I knew the opportunity I was given, like you have been given, if you look one generation before, your parents had very little, right? Yes? So all of you guys have been given some incredible opportunities. So that motivated me. In fact, the people of Tamil Nadu and the people of India motivated me because I knew how little they had. So when I came to the United States, so in by 1978, this 14-year-old boy, he was a boy now, okay? He wasn't this 49-year-old man. You have to remember, 14-year-old old boy had completed all the mathematics courses in his high school. So I used to go, I was ready to go to college, by the, I was four years ahead of everyone. But I was not only good at math, uh, academics, I was a very good athlete. You know, I enjoyed sports, I was a number one baseball player on the all-white high school team. So I, my parents brought me up to do good, you can clap. <laughs> um, so my parents brought me up to be good in both athletics, which means take care of your physical body and your mental body, right? which is actually, by the way, what our Siddhars taught thousands of years ago, okay? Mind and body, right? So this was the basis of our tradition, whole system thinking, okay? This was, again, what the Siddhars taught. These are all part of our culture, by the way, which you guys are unfortunately losing, and hopefully you won't after this talk, and will be compelled to want to go understand, okay? So in 1978, I'd finished all the math courses, and I was, frankly, very bored. So in the newspaper in the, in the early spring of 1970, it was a newspaper ad, not an ad, but an article, and an uh, individual by the name of Henry Mullish, a professor at a university, New York University. So a professor at a university, New York University is one of the most, probably the top 10 universities in the world, in the United States. He thought it would be interesting to invite young high school students and he would select 40 of them to come to New York at the university in an eight-week, two-month intensive course and learn computer programming, okay? So they selected 40 students. So I was the one of the 40 who was fortunate to be selected. I was the only Tamil Indian student of that group. Everyone else was American. And I would take the bus from New Jersey to the train station at 5 in the morning and then at 6 in the morning take the train to New York, which is about an hour and a half ride. So I would be there at 7.30 for my 8 a.m. class. It would go from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And in those days, New York was a very dangerous place. A 14-year-old child should not be going to New York. But again, my parents were very open and uh, supportive. So I, I did that. I, I, I knew how to carry myself. So 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for eight weeks, this young 14-year-old studied among university professors with other people. In fact, I was the youngest kid. Everyone was 16 or 17. Ended up graduating number one in the class, and I learned seven computer languages. In fact, I was well trained to be a professional programmer. Because remember, 1978, if I, there, you couldn't even find this many programmers in the entire United States. If you asked a hand how many people were programming was, maybe one person would raise their hand. It was very new. Software was very new in 1978. So here were 40 probably the first group of students educated in the entire world out of, the, uh, out of, out of this university. 